middle of the photo. <laughs> Love it. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lauren Rudman. I will be today's moderator. And I wanted to welcome all of you to our first quarter Red Brick Leadership Series event today. We're with Michelle Tamalo, who is the co-founder and chief people officer of Fit Technologies, which is located here in Cleveland, Ohio. A little bit about the Red Brick Leadership Series. This was formed back in 2020 uh, through the Miami Cleveland Alumni uh, Board. And we wanted to design and offer programming to local alumni that featured um, high profile Miami alum in the Cleveland area. So we started this series back in 2020 and have had a lot of success and a lot of views over the course of the last year. So we look forward to continuing these conversations uh, throughout the rest of the year. Um, throughout the discussion from speakers, you'll often hear about their career paths, about Miami, um, about their current role, what got them there and uh, challenges that they're facing with COVID-19 and what's really next for them in terms of the remainder of 2021, because we all know that uh, this unfortunately is not going away anytime soon. So we know businesses and people have had to pivot and we look forward to hearing about those stories. So as I mentioned, I'm joined today by Michelle Tamalo, class of 1990. She is the co-founder at Fit Technologies, and which is a managed IT services firm headquartered here in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, I'm lucky enough to know Michelle uh, personally, um, as we have served on a local nonprofit board here together. And uh, she has also, uh, as I like to say, made made a shift to the uh, to the HR world as her as her role of chief people officer at Fit Technologies. So I'm also biased because now we get to talk all things people. So I'm happy to have Michelle here today. Welcome, and uh, we'll go ahead and jump into it. All right. So take us back to Michelle Tamalo at a younger yeah. age. Um, <laughs> tell us why you chose Miami, your major, um, what activities did you participate in when you were there, such as like, you know, professional associations or anything like that. Take us back to Michelle during the Miami days. Uh, well, thank you for um, inviting me to talk with everyone today. Yeah. I'm really excited. Um, and I will uh, say this, I, I told um, the Emily who is, works at Miami that, wow, a lot of people read that newsletter uh, and knew that I was speaking because I got all sorts of messages, LinkedIn messages and text messages and all of that sort of thing. So um, yay for Miami for, for uh, broadcasting that. So excited. Yeah. Okay, so um, how did I choose Miami? This was an interesting a whole like walk down memory lane and I also realized how many things um, get all jumbled in my brain, but um, I went to high school in uh, Centerville, Ohio. So get up mighty mighty Elks in case there's any uh, Centerville alumni on this call, um, which is located near Dayton. And I knew I wanted to be a business major. Um, Miami and um, University of Michigan were my kind of two um, places that I wanted to go. I realized I. Um, uh, University of Michigan was huge. And when we went there and visited, I think I felt like, wowza. Um, loved the college town though. And so that was a big selling point and felt like it was far enough away from Dayton that um, it didn't feel like um, I was so close to home. So that's how I um, decided uh, to do that. Um, in terms of my major, again, I was pretty sure I wanted to major in business. Um, and in terms of the things that I was involved in at Miami, um, I'm, I, that's been a trend of my life, I think is being involved in different things. Uh, so right off the bat, I ran for hall president, um, in Dorsey, get up East quad. Uh, and, um, that just was pretty amazing to be one of those, uh, student leaders at Miami. You've got a sense of how we then use student government to, um, impact decision making, make changes, kind of how that worked. I was involved in student government all four years at Miami. Um, my senior year, I ended up um, actually being chief of staff for student body president. And so that was just really um, interesting to see how kind of all of that worked. I was, um, I rushed my sophomore year. 
um, got into data theta, cap alpha theta, um, was, was involved from a leadership perspective within my sorority. And even after I graduated, um, I was a rush guy, if you can imagine that. Um, by being involved in student government, I learned about um, all those activities that were happening on campus. And I literally did as many things as I could, whether it was going to comedy shows or improv or going to concerts or um, anytime we had famous people come on campus. Wow, I took advantage of those for sure. Um, and one highlight that I'll share with that, like, so imagine, and I don't even know, what was that one? What's that hall kind of, you walk out of King Library and then it's right there. It's not that big. What is that? Alumni Hall? What is that? They had performances there, like yeah. uh, think? choral concerts and all that sort of thing. So imagine being there with however many people fit in there, 500, 800, whatever, 1,000, and having Kurt Vonnegut read to you and answer questions from students, like that sort of thing, or Maya Angelou or Oprah. Um, or Jay Leno, that was in a small group that we got to. So loved all of that sort of thing. Nice. Um, and then the, I was an RA my second year um, at Miami. And one of the things that I um, always share with people was that was an amazing experience. And I didn't realize when I was in it. But, you know, imagine being a 20-year-old. Um, some of you may even have kids who are 20 years old now. And it wasn't just dealing with, oh, you know, who burned the popcorn and make sure to not leave your shampoo bottles in the shower. But we had really significant things that came up in the hall that um, I was a resident assistant for and things like suicide and miscarriages and eating disorders and things like that. And it was heavy and it's very interesting to think back on how to navigate to resources back then as opposed to now, that those are much more readily available um, on university campuses because we raise the awareness of issues like that far more than we did before. Wow. And I can go on and on and talk more, um, but I'll just move on from here. I will say uh, mm -hmm. that I also worked when I was at school. I worked in the physics department and that was interesting. Holy smokes, that's some weird dudes. Um, I think there was one woman professor and everyone else was like, I wish I would have been smart enough to just take documentary footage because um, that was craziness. Um, and um, I also worked in the ed psych department um, and just learned um, all sorts of things about, again, how those departments worked and the personality of these professors that there was still that kind of hierarchy of student to professors. And I think that it was um, a great part of my education. Excellent. And it didn't lead you to want to change your major from business to physics? Well, I love that you asked that. I only had one big, do I change my major crises? And it wasn't to physics, anyone who knows me. Um, it was, I loved my honors English classes. I loved my writing classes. Um, I probably had uh, crushes on two of my English professors because they were so smart. Um, and I was gonna be an English teacher, like I was gonna switch. Um, and so I worked through that whole thing and then I stuck with business and ended up getting a social minor and an English minor. And then my focus was in organizational development, even uh, college. Okay, so that, yeah, so that led you to help, you know, was a precursor to where you are today. So, okay, so it's graduation, you have to figure out what the heck you wanna be when you grow up, you know, and leaving Oxford, which is, always a sad, um, you know, it's a bittersweet day, right? When we all leave Oxford. So tell us then, where did life take Michelle leading up to today? I did not leave Oxford. My oh. first job was with a mid-sized healthcare organization called Communicare Health Services. They were based out of Cincinnati and they had um, home care, assisted living, nursing homes, kind of all over the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And through a friend of mine, um, I found out that they wanted to hire a new position, like a community liaison who would make connections with our facility um, in the city. And I said, well, that's interesting. Uh, I totally could do that. Like, I know the city. I feel invested in the city. Um, 
And so I went to work there in Oxford. Um, and once I got into that, uh, I was, you know, like a community relations person. And then I um, became the director of resident services. And then I said, well, if I'm doing this, I probably should just go get my nursing home administrator license. So uh, I did that. Um, those sort of things. And then um, I worked for Communicare for uh, about uh, six years. But the interesting thing that happened during this period is my former husband, his family uh, owned a family business up in Cleveland. And so there was a big decision of do we move from Cincinnati? Because we, um, I lived in Oxford for about two years, bought a house in Cincinnati, made the commute back to Oxford, um, and then was doing more work in Cincinnati at the time um, through that same organization. And so then that's pretty big life milestone is we made the decision to move to Cleveland and we moved here in 1994. So I have, uh, I call Cleveland home by all means um, and love having, uh, being invested in this city. So I um, worked at Communicare as a nursing home administrator by the time I left there, um, came to work um, to a facility here in Cleveland. So I was able to move with my same organization um, the facility where I worked was on East 55th. It's still there. It's called City View Rehabilitation Center for anyone. It's kind of catty corner from the mission, yeah. city mission. Um, but I was living in Amherst, way west side. And so that commute was something. And so then I um, said to one of my friends, like I only knew like three people here, um, that I want to make a change. And so um, she told me about um, an organization in Lorraine County that was a hospice. And I have been working in um, long-term care uh, with uh, the hospice program. And so I went for an interview, again, for a position that was new and kind of made up. And I pitched myself to do that. And so then um, left Communicare and then went to work for New Life Hospice uh, and worked for New Life for four-ish years. Um, and then when um, Mickey Tubbs, who founded the New Life Hospice, um, she sold that back to a health system. Um, I retired from there and um, then started doing consulting work. And then, um, interestingly enough, in ready for this. So this is all 1990-ish, uh, 1990-ish. 1999 um, Mickey's brother came to her and said, I have an idea for a business. Um, Mickey's a serial entrepreneur and I have only worked in startup sort of projects. So um, we said, we'll help you get started with this idea for a web-based software business in 1999. So everyone kind of think back to that. There was nothing to market then where Parents and students and administrators could log in and get data, homework, grades, all that sort of thing. Um, and so in 1999, we founded a company called School One uh, to develop this software. And so schools were our uh, client, uh, prospective client at the time. I'm going to yada, 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 a bunch of fit technologies history here because um, it's its own HBO miniseries. Hopefully when I retire in a few years, then we're gonna work on that screenplay. And uh, in the chat, you all can work on who you think should play me. Parker Pony is kind of, yeah, whatever. You all talk amongst yourself and get back to me. So it is 1999. Getting money is easy, seemingly. Everyone's doing it. Tech bubble, it's cool. Just pet rocks and crazy ass things. Uh, in Cleveland, some of the stories were insane what people got money to do. So, um, we were getting started, had a team, uh, literally our first venture meeting. They loved it. That was on a Tuesday, uh, on a Thursday, uh, was when the huge, uh, tech bubble, uh, the bust happened and, uh, we never got that big chunk of money. And so we then strapped for a good three to four years to build our company. Um, 
And while we were focused on software and schools, how we got to be a managed IT services company, and again, I'm yada, 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 and this is as we went to install um, and implement software in schools, web-based software, uh, schools networks and infrastructure were not set up for web-based uh, software. It was when people were trying to do multimedia, uh, so Discovery Channel and all of that. So all that was coming in. Um, so that's how we then ended up getting consultants and engineers on staff to then do a full assessment of what a school would need to be able to use software like this. Web-based software, but still their networks needed to change. Um, uh, all the machines that they were running on, all that needed to change. And so um, we started that part of our business in O2. So I'm going to pause there because literally the evolution of fit really um, could take its own hour. Uh, but I will say this is, um, there's a few kind of milestones in that. I mentioned one, which is Tech Bubble Bust. Um, the next was 9-11. Um, uh, literally, it paralyzed so many industries, but in schools, it was like uh, adoption of this kind of software took pioneers and innovators, and people were so nervous to do anything different. It was like, um, hold on your hats. Built our business, grew exponentially, were poised for growth, and then the recession happened, which was a doozy. Um, Took some time to sell off a few divisions. At that time, we were probably the same size as we are now, had about 250 employees. Um, so in 2013, it was almost like we were a startup business again. We had 25 employees. We then had to you know, resize and do all of that sort of thing. And then in 2013, the recession forced us to say, what kind of company do we want to be? And we were laser focused on being a managed IT services firm sold off software um, and that team. And we actually had a school uniform business, which is why it needs to be HBO miniseries because that you can still talk about that. Uh, so from 2013 until now, it's been like we're a new um, organization and we are uh, delighted to say the least about our growth. And um, we're at about 100 employees now. Um, we're a little over $20 million company. Uh, we have staff in about 14 states, uh, and the growth is the plan. Growth is pretty significant. We can talk about that. We talk about what people need in this world of COVID and other things. But yeah, hey, I'll take a breath because you know I can just do it. Go on and on. I love it. Thank you. I didn't. Re I, I don't think I ever realized that there were so many different divisions of. I mean, for as long as I've known you, how many different divisions there were in the past. So very cool. Very cool. Well, very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. And we'll and definitely start thinking about who will uh, who'll cast you in that HBO Max. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know. So you know, you founded. You were co-founder. You know, you decided to take the leap and jump into this entrepreneurial world. And now, over the last two-ish years, you've 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 taken the co-founder role and added the chief people officer um, role to your to your resume. <laughs> tell us, you know, tell me about that. I mean, personally, I'm always fascinated with when people who don't grow up in HR come into HR and, and you know, being the, you know, the culture champion or the people, you know, managing the people, head of talent, uh, people and culture, whatever, you know, terms people like to use for, for the role. But I mean, what did you, what did you expect going into it? What did that ev evolution look like? How is it different, you know, putting on a founder's hat versus now putting on a chief people officer hat? So, I mean, I think a few things to clarify in this is one of the reasons that like having a title like co-founder is what we learned in business here. Many times you can have a title. It could be president. It could be CEO. And so people might think you you now have a job. And that's your title, as opposed to you founded this company 21 years ago. And so that's one thing about like the reason that that co-founder title is there, because yeah, that's why yeah. I have um, founding a business and then growing it um, and having it look like this, as opposed to you know like this, is kind of significant from that perspective. Yeah. One of the reasons that the title of chief people officer. Um, 
came into play was that HR technically has always been part of my role, especially from um, culture perspective, hiring, that sort of thing. But once we became an ESOP, uh, and that means we'll talk about that in a minute, it made sense that we changed some titles around because with the um, ESOP structure, there's a organization that holds all the shares of our company. And the titles in that overarching um, organization needed to be different. And so if I was president of Fit Technologies, but I was vice president of the board, it, we didn't want to confuse things. So we left Mickey with the CEO role um, and president role. And I had a president role title before. So, um, but the cool thing about having a title like chief people officer is as a, especially as a service business, we know that our growth, um, the success of our organization is because of those people. And when I think about some of the strengths that I have, I think that um, the ability to be a good cheerleader, be direct with communication, um, help build processes around some things that are complex and some things that are simple. So that's where we kind of opted to come up with that uh, sort of title. We debated about that or chief culture officer, um, but there was so much around the HR function and um, especially hiring and recruiting. We still have so much work to do, um, but it was exciting that, you know, we have this new, um, you know, we have a new ESOP. It's again, another sort of milestone as we look to the future of the organization. And so changing the title was um, an exciting part of that. And again, it's been, um, We've been very focused on um, uh, talent attraction. Uh, again, it's a growing company. Uh, and for anyone who's in our market, and I'm sure that it's true in other markets, we have more open jobs in Cleveland than we have tech talent for. And so this idea of how we look to um, attract people from outside the region, uh, as well as um, get people who normally are in tech, women, people of color, LGBTQ folks, um, how do we make that um, happen as well? And that's been one of the things that's been a nice alignment of my civic involvement is um, uh, finding ways to do that differently. Yeah, excellent. All right, so a lot to unpack from there. So first, talk to us about the transition to an ESOP and, and maybe talk, um, not everybody might be familiar with this. Maybe you could talk a little bit about it. What made you guys want to do that? How's it going thus far? Yes. So um, an ESOP is an employee stock ownership plan, not options, but an ownership plan where um, the employees actually own the company. And as Mickey and I were looking at succession plans for the organization, we built this company and we knew that we were doing well, being successful. So around 2015, we were trying to look at what does that um, plan look like? Um, Mickey's looking to retire. We knew um, somewhere around 21, 22. Um, and so for a company like ours, there's, well, for many companies, there's probably a few options there. One is, um, sell to an organization about our size who wants to roll up or um, who's already managed ICT service provider. Another is to sell to private equity um, because they want to put that into their portfolio, maximize that and sell it off. Um, another would be to um, be bought by a large provider that has managed IT under it, like IBM, like HP, like um, Konica Minolta copiers, all covered, that sort of thing. So while that probably could have been um, advantageous from a profitability standpoint to Mickey and me, every time we thought about like saying, hey, everybody, guess what? we have big news, it never felt like, we, like that's who we are. Like this was much more about knowing that this group of people had helped us be able to get here. So um, we learned more about ESOPs. Uh, to see if we were in a, had a structure or that that made sense. And so um, interestingly enough, there's about 
only about 7,000 ESOPs in our country. Um, and I think it's that most people don't even know that might not be an option for them. And so once we started um, down that path, um, had a team of advisors helping us do that, lots of accountants, lots of attorneys, God bless you all. Um, making all that happen, that uh, got finalized in 2018. And so basically we sold the company to our employees. And what that means is that it's a retirement benefit so that each year, if we're doing well, and that makes sense, that shares of the company go into the retirement accounts of our employees. So the thought that we can have employees who are making $48,000 or $60,000 at the, at the end of 20 or 30 years, potentially be millionaires. We love the idea of that. Uh, and felt like it was a amazing way to create economic equity um, just by virtue of you know, structuring the company this way. Love it. That's a big, uh, that was a big risk taking. I mean, so you mentioned obviously a lot of attorneys, a lot of, a lot of uh, accountants that have to go into that process. I mean, for anybody who, for anybody who might be listening or, or tunes into the, to the replay, what's one to two pieces of advice you would say to people who are business owners, you know, such as yourself who want to explore ESOP, um, you know, for their succession plan and for their employees? Well, I th again, having a good group of advisors yeah. makes a lot of sense because I do think there's some myths out there that um, uh, the way that ESOPs, ESOPs are, can be um, very, very different. I said there's about 7,000 in the country. They can be structured very differently. Mm -hmm. um, our organization happened. We sold all of the shares of our company to our employees. Others may have, you know, partial shares. So the, the whole idea of kind of do your homework from people who can advise. There's definitely an investment that will need to be made to kind of determine if that's a path that makes sense. Um, I, I just, you know, for us, it's a great um, motivator to our staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we know we're just, you know, we're only two years in and a lot of there's um, a lot of mechanics that need to be done from a compliance end of things. Um, uh, this is managed under um, the same, uh, ERISA laws as 401k, so it's not like willy nilly, it's very regulated. Um, but then just the engagement that we have from our staff um, to help us solve problems or um, be more successful or understand their role as ambassadors, and all of that has an impact on um, kind of their compensation, their retirement plan. Yeah, excellent. Always good and to have advisors. Yeah, and happy to talk with anyone who is thinking of wanting to explore some of that. Okay, great. So 2020 brought on a global pandemic uh, that we are all still in the midst of. I mean, tell us about how fit, um, I mean, what was business like and, and, and how, how have you guys managed it? You know, as a managed IT services firm, you're not only, you know, you're worried about your employees and their safety and their health, but then you also have your customers and your clients who you have to go out and you know, continue to provide services for. So could you tell us about what life's been like over the last year, 10 months? Yeah. yeah. So as a managed IT services firm, 60% uh, of our staff go on site to clients on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Up to before the pandemic, that was what would happen. When the pandemic happened and whatever that date was, the 15th, when the governor said, hey, stay home, um, when people stayed home, you can imagine the calls to our help desk went through, uh, we think that in, I don't know the stats exactly, but that first in March or that first month, I think we had more calls in that one month than we did in like six months Wow! because it was go home and we'll figure it out. Some organizations were just varying degrees of being ready to, to be ready for, um, staff to work remotely. But then for um, a lot of our clients, it um, identified areas that they needed to make investment in or make changes for, just from a security perspective, let alone a productivity perspective. Then also imagine that about half of our clients, about 150 of our clients, 
our schools. So um, the, that was all hands on deck to get them set up to do remote learning as best possible. And again, some schools were, again, varying degrees of that uh, in the spring, but for sure heading into August, wow. Um, just the volume of everything. And again, if I had been smart, I would have bought stock in um, Zoom and uh, Chromebooks and yeah. bought all the Chromebooks and kept them in our basement and then doled them out. Um, but on any, like, you know, just what, three weeks ago, we uh, received an image 900 Chromebooks to go back out to schools because they're still trying to figure out how to deal with hybrid models or other um, situations that may arise, especially around testing or those sort of things. So our staff has been very engaged uh, throughout the entire pandemic. Um, once we had some uh, return to work in March um, or in May, you know, we have staff that come into our office and we have protocol around that and those sort of things. But like everyone, it's been um, it's one thing to regulate what happens here in the office. It's completely different than to work to keep people healthy um, outside of the office or who they're coming into contact with and all of that sort of thing. But as you know, in HR, as anyone knows, um, we were dealing with things every single week. We don't know the answer to that. Let's figure that out. Right. You know, we were on. Um, Every nonprofit that I was part of, we were on emergency calls, what, three, four times a week sometimes, trying to figure that out. There would be then, um, you know, protocols that need to be um, taken care of. And really it was, while we made a policy, so many people needed to be um, handled on one-on-one -on -one basis, what was happening with them, with their family, um, and with the client. Yeah. And the other part of this too is, um, in addition to schools, we have a our largest other sector is healthcare, and uh, that didn't stop. So uh, for us, um, you know, again, our staff is amazing, um, pulling together and making sure that clients have services that they need. And for a while there, it was everything was uh, a priority one. It's all on fire because everyone was all of our clients were just struggling to get what they needed um, to have any sense of productivity um, is one thing, but then when you're providing uh, critical services in healthcare, that has to be done. Yeah, oof. Two, two hard industries to continue to pro provide service and so congrats to you guys for keeping at it and keep going and hopefully, uh, you know, sooner we can get these vaccines and, you know, Yes. Life will be a smidge easier. So, yes. Good. Um, so tell us, you know, obviously people got to know you over the last 30 minutes or so. So they probably already have a good idea. But, you know, tell us a little bit about how, you know, your leadership style, you know, maybe it's maybe it's shifted over the course of, um, you know, year. Some people do. Some people don't. I mean, tell us, you know, tell us about that. And um, and especially, too, has anything changed? you know, since founding a company, um, you know, and, and, and working more with, you know, directly with people too. Well, I, I mean, I think things shift a little just because we get older and we get wiser. Yeah. Um, I like me, I don't like to but for a lot there, we would team that one of our yearly metrics was, you know, Michelle isn't getting sued for saying inappropriate things in the office. So um, that sort of thing. But so that's, and as we've grown, I mean, there's something very different about 25-ish people working in a similar space and now having 100 people working in 12 states, uh, 14 states, that sort of thing. So some of that changes a little bit. Um, I would hope that I've become um, a better leader in that uh, I know myself, I think I've known myself well, though, for most of my life, I, I really do. Um, but getting clear about strengths, um, my strengths, so that then when I'm 
working with the group or leading with the group, how's all that kind of being received? And really it's about how to work with the folks on your work team or who are reporting to you, how to, how do they want to be motivated? What's important to them? What's their communication style? And kind of, um, you know, balancing that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, there was plenty of times in my career that uh, it took me a while to figure it out, especially early in my career, that mm-hmm. uh, people didn't know what to do with my energy or um, would um, somehow um, think that was coming from a bad place as opposed to, no, like, this isn't, this is real. Like, this is the passion that I'm bringing that or that energy. Um, and sometimes I think that that was, um, people try to downplay that or uh, ignore that or tell me who do I think I am sort of thing. Um, and it, it is a bit different because once you're the owner of the company, like you don't have people saying, you may be an outside organization saying, who do you think you are? But um, I'm trying to think if there's other, um, I think that I'm a, very collaborative in terms of the way in which I interact with folks in our organization and people who are on my work team. Um, process out loud, so people have to get ready for that. Um, <laughs> sometimes okay for the introverts and sometimes not, but again, it's kind of the naming things. And uh, I think that a directness with good intention is how I would describe my leadership style as opposed to a directness that would feel confrontational or accusatory. Yeah, good. Um, You are probably one of the most involved people I know in the nonprofit civic world um, here in Cleveland and and, I'm sure beyond. But uh, tell our audience a little bit about, first, I mean, you know, what organizations are you currently part of or maybe have been part of in the past? And uh, in particular, you know, what advice would you have for people who are looking to add nonprofit experience into their, you know, into their life, whether that's through volunteerism or, or perhaps a board position? It's, I mean, I think the question starts and ends with passion and what you're excited about. What would you be, for me, it's what kind of, um, mission aligned organizations make me excited to um, be part of. And sometimes that's also been about who's already involved in that nonprofit, as you know, um, Mm -hmm. from being on the Engage Cleveland board uh, together, is that that sometimes has been um, a draw for me. But I think as people look at um, what's, how are they civically involved, I think that it's important that um, it's not just who might ask you, but literally think about the kinds of organizations that you do have um, passion about. And as everyone knows, Cleveland is such a philanthropic town, mm-hmm. so generous, so giving with so many nonprofits that um, there's always going to be an opportunity in an organization that you're excited about the mission. So I, that's how I would. Um, put that out there um, to folks about, especially about volunteering or being involved in, um, if people aren't ready or don't want to commit to um, board involvement, there's organizations always need volunteers to work in many different ways. Um, There's um, also the ability to be involved in specific projects or specific events as a host or an ambassador or um, something like that, that then you might not be signing up for the same sort of, Time commitment and definitely you're not signing up to be, you know, a board member with fiduciary responsibility. That's sort of thing. Um, I have been involved um, for a long time, for the longest time, with Plexus, the LGBT and Allied Chamber of Commerce here in Cleveland, which many people who know me probably are aware of that because it's been such a long tenure with that organization. And um, I just have to say that the reason that I got involved with Plexus was this. Um, I have kept advocacy over here separate from the development of our business. And when I learned about Plexus as the LGBT chamber to realize that there's organizations like that here in the region and then all over the country that are kind of um, 
marrying those two things. And many chambers of commerce do that. But in this situation, um, being involved in an organization that could help LGBTQ entrepreneurs get the resources that they need to start their business and feel supported in their business, as well as being part of the mission to create organizations that are more open, more diverse, more welcoming. Um, that just really speaks to me. And I think it's also when we think about the biggest part of that is um, the more that we can do that in our organizations, the more that our region is going to be seen that way. And it's important when we talk about the much bigger um, discussion that we started with about um, talent attraction and attracting people to uh, Greater Cleveland. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to Plexus, um, have been involved with you um, in Age Cleveland, which works to um, attract and retain um, young professionals. Um, all of you probably know this intuitively, but um, research has shown us that when we can engage people early in their career, they tend to then stay in that region. And so Engage Cleveland was formed to do just that. Um, I think that that's great work that's being done. Um, I'm, uh, I've been involved in the neighborhood, like the um, where I live and where I work. Um, and so right now I'm on the um, warehouse district board. I live downtown uh, in a condo. Um, our office is in Playhouse Square. I'm looking at the chandelier out there. Um, uh, so we're, we're located here. Um, I'm involved in uh, arts organizations because I'm just fascinated um, by the creativity of people's brains that of doing things that I can uh, even fathom uh, doing. So Graffiti Heart um, and um, uh, Progressive Arts Alliance um, are organizations that are doing great things. And so definitely um, those are all organizations that I've been involved in. Cleveland Public Theater, um, that sort of thing. So really, again, there's so many um, organizations. If I, we probably should have had them scrolling like on the video feed there. Well, like I said, I, knew, I know that you're one of the you know most involved people I know, and I know that those organizations certainly benefit from having you, your, you and your experience and your energy just all around helping them out. So, and I'm sure that that was especially um, helpful to those organizations when the pandemic hit and trying to figure out what the heck to do. So, I know that that was very beneficial for them. People are resilient and smart. That is for sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have we might have some uh, attendees either live or who watch the replay who are college grads um, or going to be college grads soon. So, what's your best career advice for for our future future Miami alumni? Well, if you can go back to school, then go into tech, yeah, or manufacturing that's related to tech, um, or health sciences related to tech. I mean, literally, um, it's so. Uh, the opportunity from an engineering perspective, from a data analytics, from um, those sectors that are struggling to grow and ready to grow, we need more tech talent. But and as, in addition to that, I think uh, I would say uh, start building your network as soon as you can. And even if that um, starts with uh, working this Miami alumni network, I think that it's great. I think that if you're interested in a certain career, um, I think asking people like us who've been in that career to meet with us, talk, have coffee, that sort of thing, I just think that it really um, is helpful to folks. And um, the great thing about at least Greater Cleveland is we're the best little big city that really you're one degree of separation from pretty much everyone. Um, and so I just think that it's important that people have a chance to talk to people about their career because I think that it's it's fascinating and remarkable um, to hear about those milestones and critical decisions and things like that. Uh, and then I would just say the other thing, and this is true for um, people who are new to their career or any point in their career, the better that you know yourself, the better you're going to be able to evaluate anything, a new job opportunity, a new leadership opportunity. You're going to be able to be more effective with your work teams, with the people who report to you. Um, I think that that's an important part 
So you're aware of that because then your goal is then to figure out what motivates, have the conversation to figure out what motivates them, um, what do they want to achieve, all of those sort of things. Yeah. Excellent advice. Um, so you've been in Cleveland now for, you know, 20, 20 ish, you know, years, we'll call it, um, maybe a little longer, 25. So, you know, it's, we just started 2021. Um, our city, you know, has, our city has been pretty resilient, you know, using your, you know, using your word that people are resilient. Clevelanders are resilient, uh, especially over the course of the last, you know, 50, 60 years. So pretend it's 2025. Um, what would you like, what would, what, what does Cleveland look like to you during that time? And, you know, from either downtown, you know, where you, you know, you mentioned, you know, you live or, or just kind of what our region looks like. So forecast out magic this football. This is my magic wand. Okay. Sorry. Love it. A Wayne's world sort of thing going on. There. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, I mean, I'm, I don't know how and when we, this recovery from COVID feels like, when does that turn? Is that 2022, 23? I'm not sure. But some things that I would love to see happen here in Cleveland is one, we are going to get um, new leadership in the city in 2021 with a mayoral election that's critical to um this great city um the following year after that 2022 we're going to be electing a new county executive uh which i think that those two two key roles are really important to what happens here um the we have such great public private partnerships with major institutions and so how do we um have our thriving downtown Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's thought that we wanted to be at 20,000 residents by 2020. I think we got really close. And then with the pandemic, that, um, shimmy, it would be, I think it'd be awesome if we had, um, uh, more affordable housing downtown that could be purchased so that, um, instead of having renters, um, create more of a, um, transient community that people, we can, we can have, um, neighbors who live in a neighborhood for a lot more neighbors who live in the neighborhood for a long time mm -hmm. um, this idea of um development along the waterfront um and not east and west like euclid and edgewater but um those plans to uh get people as close to the water as possible down by the port and things like that i would love if that's um in play or happening uh we, yeah, this could be its own podcast about what Michelle wants to see happen in uh, Raleigh City in relation to education, in relation to uh, racial equity, in relation to um, health disparities and those sort of things that this year has allowed um, uh, many organizations and institutions and leadership to um, raise with a, micro with a megaphone. Um, and so those would be Good to see if those those types of programs can be in place to make um, real impact there, especially in education. Say yes to education is an uh, amazing opportunity for um, the young people um, in that when you attend schools in the city of Cleveland, you will be able to um, go to school, go to college um, or a post uh, high school uh, program free of charge um, through that fund. So I'm going to stop because I could really babble on and on uh, about that sort of thing. Um, really excited to yeah, see thriving streets with people being close to each other and have density uh, within our cities and utilizing the convention center and our hotels and um, our restaurants and Sherwin-Williams entire new campus is going to change the face of um, the warehouse district and um, all those types of things. Yeah. I just can't wait to pet people and be close to them. <laughs> yes, and hugs, right? Definitely. Yes. Those are great yes. points. And especially for, you know, for um, I'm glad you hit on two of the major um, events, you know, with Mayor, um, Mayor, 
mayoral election uh, coming up as well as a uh, county executive election next year. So definitely two important uh, 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 situations that will be coming up that we all need to be educating ourselves on. So thanks for bringing yes. those. Those are great. Yeah. All right. It is time to round robin with you. So for okay. we're going to need some questions. And I'm getting nervous about round, round robins. So. I promise they're not scary. So for okay. our audience, uh, we like to do round robins at the end uh, just to learn a little bit more about uh, about our, our uh, panelists. So these questions tend to focus more on Miami as well as Cleveland. So, Michelle, first, you just have to say the first thing that comes okay. to your head. All right. All right. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, these are starting Miami. First, favorite place on campus? Um, King Library in the one corner. I would love to. It was so quiet and I would nap there a lot, but I love the peacefulness of that. And then I'm going to say Western campus. Okay, good. Any place on Western or just, just Western as a whole? Yeah, that kind of that grove and that bridge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that you would walk from whatever mm -hmm. across there. I loved that. I loved being there. And I always felt like um, it wasn't in the hub of, of um, the university. And it was nice um, to be like, have those amenities there in that college town. Yeah. Good. Okay. Favorite place off campus. Well, our house where we live. So I didn't even um, talk about. So um, I lived on North Main Street with um, 10 women in a house called Private Idaho and lived there two years in a row. So I'm going to have to say that Private Idaho across from McCullohyde um, Hospital was uh, my favorite place off campus, of course. Wonderful. Right. Win. Any other favorite establishments on North High Street? Um, well, I we were regular Mac and Joe goers. Um, balcony for sure. Um, we all have, you know, insane quarter beer stories from Lottie Moons. Yes. <laughs> I'm loving any of that, but, um, yeah. And it was nice to hang at Skippers yeah. for sure. Good. Bruno's, all right. I can go on. Bruno's pizza. I mean, are we going to get to, um, Chuck Burgers? All right. My next answer is going to be Chuck Burgers, no matter what you say. All right. Good to know. All right. Now here's some Cleveland questions. So, Favorite Cleveland sports team? The Cavs. Favorite, okay, and this is pretend COVID is not going on. Favorite yeah. Cleveland restaurant? Um, I can't just name one, but um, Albatross, Tremont Tap House, Spice before it closed. Yes. Um, those are my favorites. Okay. Uh, favorite Cleveland landmark? So when people think of Cleveland, what's the favorite landmark you would point them to? Well, there's several, but uh, I'm definitely going to say um, I'm going to share the whole chandelier thing. I was we lived in this building, uh, had our office here in this building since 06. And then we heard that chandelier was coming. I kept rolling my eyes like saying it was going to be some Vegas freak show. Uh, and then what it turned out to be is really a lovely and amazing. And I love that they it's done what the intention was, which was create a landmark within the, uh, within the city that people come and see. And it is kind of a, an amazing feat. It has all sorts of Guinness records associated to it. So love the chandelier. Um, can't say enough about how dry or running across the, uh, Carnegie bridge with the guardians. Um, I would say 80% of the time that I run, I will cry because I look at them. There's just something about it. That's so profound. Uh, and I love our lake as um, an asset that I think so many people um, don't necessarily um, have the chance to kind of get down in it and on it and that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Favorite Cleveland activity? So with friends, family, visitors? Well, again, I have to say being on the lake. Um, I also love um, being part of uh pandemonium at cleveland public theater which is their big fundraiser that happens in september i think again it's astounding to see all those performances uh i do love going to solstice at cma i love the fact that we have uh the cleveland museum of art um 
right here and uh, with its world-renowned collection. And that's one of my favorite things to do for sure. Um, I love going on walks along uh, the river. And again, the river is one of those things that I think people are just like, wait, what, where is that? What is it? How does it work? Um, and I'll tell one funny story. I lived, and I mean peculiar, uh, I lived in the Flats East Bank. And so, you know, Margaritaville mm -hmm. right next to there. And of course, again, I was like, what? what? We need that one. And then God bless Jimmy Buffett, uh, because the following of people who know about Margaritaville brought tons of people down to downtown that never would um, have been there. I would hear on a regular basis. What is that? Where are we? Is that a river? Is that the lake? What is so? Yeah. Those assets are just amazing that we um, have them and we can do a lot to um, allow more activity on them. Yep, we're very lucky. Uh, okay, two more. East side, west side. I'm just saying. Okay. And then last one. One word to describe Cleveland. Grit or resilience. Love it. Love it. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to um, Emily to, uh, I think we had some uh, questions come in, so I will let her uh, take those from here. All right, two quick questions. So what is the best advice that you received as a founder? Um, knowing everything you know now, what advice would you give to a new founder? So one is something that was advice given to us, which had to do with um, someone said very early in our business, cash is king. And again, it's all fine in your business when things are fine, but there's ours in our company, like many others, there's an example of there's so many things outside of your business that you can't control. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that you understand um, how you make money and yeah. how your dollars uh, are going to be used to make sure that you are making the best decisions because they're hard um, about what needs to happen, especially in relation to your finances and cash. And the other one I would just say is, again, it's hard. Organizations are made up of people. They're organic things. But when there's people who it doesn't make sense for them to be part of your organization because of um, their role or where your organization is or those sort of things, make those decisions sooner than later. <clears throat> yeah. Hard. But there's that in the, in the short and long run. All right, perfect. And one last one. So what tips do you have, especially during this time when we can't see people face to face um, for, for connecting with people that you want to do business with and establishing that initial rapport and even with your employees as well? Well, again, we could have crowdsourced this. It's it's I think it's super challenging new relationships. It's one thing to, you know, say to Lauren, who I know, hey, let's. um get together and talk for 30 minutes because I, it is really challenging um, with new business, but we press on and we do it uh, and try to have as, um, you know, much contact and energy come through that as we would if we were, you know, sitting face to face. Um, and with employees, well, I don't think anyone thought it would ha go this long. Uh, I say God bless our employees who were onboarded and got hired during this. We just, they deserve like, I don't know, um, stress pay or something like that, additional stress pay. Um, so doing things like virtual happy hours and definitely activities where people are engaging with each other and getting to know each other. Um, the same thing that Emily, you were talking about with the things that you're doing with the, with the alumni, um, flower classes and candle making classes and um, tastings and all of those sort of things. Those are all things that all of us organizations are trying to kind of make connections um, with each other and use online tools as best possible and not, you know, take, take um, small, even the smallest of things, uh, someone getting a puppy um, 
or something big time getting promotion and figuring out a way to kind of um, elevate that to be part of the conversation on a day-to-day -day basis, to have people feel connected um, because we are working with this distance. Yeah. Excellent advice. Well, we are at the hour. So uh, I want to say thank you, Michelle, uh, for those who joined Michelle Tamalo, co-founder and chief people officer of Fit Technologies. Thank you for joining us. Awesome discussion. And selfishly, I was glad to see you and catch up with you. Uh, thank yeah. you to the Miami staff, uh, Emily and others behind the scenes for, for running today's um, Red Brick Leadership Series. Please keep an eye out on our uh, LinkedIn as well as Facebook page for more uh, Cleveland specific events. And then also please continue to check out the alumni uh, offices, uh, the weekly newsletter that comes out with future alumni events. They have some awesome ones planned and uh, we're excited to continue 2021 in, in a safe manner, but continue to get people together. So thank you all for joining, love and honor.